Welcome. Today we're going to talk about WSQ24 and we're going to discuss the evolution of species. Again, just continuing on in our, our conversation on macroevolution. Um, today we're going to talk about what uh, the different factors are that evolution say have contributed to the diversity of species. How come there's so many different types of species? We're going to ask, um, according to evolution, how do those species actually form? How do we have new species groups? Um, how do scientists infer evolutionary relationships among different species? So how do they determine which organism led to which organism? Um, so who is our ancestor? And lastly, we're going to talk about what causes the extinction of species. So first we have to talk about variety, what, what's meant by diversity and variety. Evolutionists say that variety has been produced by, by two different factors. Okay. Um, if you guys got a chance to, if you were going to be going to Yosemite in the spring, and as you walk through Yosemite, um, you'll notice that there's a large amount of different organisms in Yosemite. Um, there's going to, we're going to see giants. Of, well, we won't see them, but excuse me. You could see the giant sequoias of Mariposa Grove. You could go and see, you know, the the different pines and redwoods that are throughout the forest. Uh, small flowers, different organisms and animals. There's a variety of different creatures just in that one place. Um, and scientists say, well, <clears throat> you know, we would say as Christians, I would say, hey, the reason why there's variety is our God created with variety. He created a variety of different kinds of animals. Kinds, when we refer to that, we're talking about basically the families, different family groups of animals. And then within those families, he gave those organisms the ability to adapt to change, to have variation. And that variation doesn't make new creatures. All it does is make variations of already current information. So um, scientists, evolutionists would say, hey, there's two things, environment and genetic variation. Environment refers to the different places where organisms live will actually develop into specific habitats. When we talk about a habitat, what we're referring to is a specific environment that uh, provides the things that a particular organism needs to survive and thrive and reproduce. So they'd say, hey, one, there's just different environments. So different environments will develop specific habitats, which will develop specific organisms. So it's almost like the environment decides, <laughs> as though it's a, an organism itself, uh, what type of organism lives there. The second is genetic variation. This is <clears throat> the mutations and changes to different traits that lead to different organisms. And we're going to talk about both of those. Um, one of the problem with genetic variation is, guys, we don't see um, examples of mutations that lead to positive uh, development and new information. What happens with mutations is you have a change in the information, a subtraction of information, um, a reordering of information, but you don't have new information being made. <clears throat> we don't see any example of organisms that have mutations where all of a sudden they have a whole bunch of new DNA. Uh, that doesn't happen. Um, scientists can do that through genetic um, engineering, but it doesn't happen in nature. So those are the two things that they say lead to the different types of organisms. So according to evolutionists, how do species form? Well, they form when a group of individuals remain isolated from the rest of its species long enough to evolve different traits. Okay, now let's listen to this again. They form when a group of individuals remains isolated from the rest of its species long enough to evolve different traits. Let's take an example. We have the Kaibab squirrel and Abert squirrel. Okay, um, these are a couple uh, squirrels that. Um, have been isolated from one another. Okay, that's what they say. And this is this is uh, these are found primarily along the Colorado River, uh, around Arizona and uh, Utah that area, <coughs> into New Mexico and Colorado. And what happens is uh, these two kinds of squirrels have been isolated. And what evolutionists say is, see, here's where the range of the Kaibab squirrel is, right here on the which would be the north side of the Grand Canyon. And on the southern side of the Grand Canyon and throughout Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, we have the rage of Abert squirrel. So they say, hey, what happened is they used to live together. They used to be the same squirrel, but then they got isolated. And through that isolation, they were in different habitats. Those different habitats led to different needs and foods and <clears throat> structures and things that they needed. And so they developed new traits and qualities through mutation over millions of years. and Hence, you're getting these new squirrels. Abert squirrel, Kaibab squirrel. Completely different, 
attributes. Some have a white belly, some have a dark belly, different ears, different tails, okay? Still squirrels, still come from the same species of squirrel, but they've kind of developed their own um, squirrelness. So their argument is, hey, given enough time, that would continue to happen and you would get a brand new species. Now, let me ask you the question. Is Aberts and Kaibab squirrels still squirrels? <laughs> They're still squirrels. And you can even read it and say this. The rest of its species long enough to evolve to, to evolve different traits, but still the same organism. The problem with this particular idea is <clears throat> the belief that because you're getting new traits, you're getting a new organism. No, no, that's microevolution. I have no problem with, and very few creationists have problem with, uh, the idea that organisms change. I think organisms change over time. I do think organisms develop new characteristics and traits. Um, when I say new characteristics and traits, it's not that they develop a new organ, <laughs> but they do develop certain affinities towards certain things. If I'm out in the sun too long, my skin gets darker. Is that because I'm turning into a different race? <clears throat> no, of course not. What's happening is my body is reacting and responding to my environment. God's given me that design and adaptation as a protection mechanism. And I think that's the same thing we have here with these particular types of organisms. Now, the other thing that happens is scientists sometimes will then take that and they'll look at species that are closely related to each other and they'll infer <clears throat> um, the relationships between those and distant species. So they'll compare DNA and proteins and fossils and the early development and body structures, all those things we talked about in WSQ 23, to determine the relationships among species. And the evolutions will take such evidences that they called, as we saw, to make a branching tree diagram to identify the relationships and their supposed relationships among organisms and ultimately the evolutionary change. They're basically guessing okay, at what they think happened. Here's an example of one. This is from McGraw-Hill. This is from a textbook in the 90s. <clears throat> Actually, probably 2000s. And this is a phylon phylogenetic tree of chordates. Chordates are organisms that have a backbone. Okay, so all of these organisms are examples of chordates. Okay, so we have cephalochordata, we have urochordata, we have um, agnatha, we've got uh, um, chondrochythites, we've got osteochytes, we've got amphibia, reptilia, aves, and mammals. Okay, these are all organisms that have a backbone. Right now, notice, okay, or these are organisms that come from the vertebrate, the chordate. So what happens? So they've said, oh, these must have been a common ancestry, like reptiles and birds and mammals all had a common ancestry back down here, where you had organisms that all had an amnion, because reptiles lay eggs and birds lay eggs, and so they have an amniotic sac and an amnion, amniotic fluid. And then they split. You had birds that developed feathers, you had reptiles that you know, developed scales, and you had um, hair that was developed by mammals but we are all commonly held in, in ancestry all they've done in this is guessed uh, based upon what they think right how the changes would have happened this is not based on fact this is not based on on uh, physical evidence this is based upon somebody's idea and perception of what they think happened but you have to be really careful when we look at phylogenetic trees so that's how they infer things. Now, ultimately, one thing that always happens is we look back in the fossil record and we see organisms that no longer exist. Okay, these are organisms that have went extinct. This is extinction is when no more members of a species remains alive. They're gone. Um, and extinction can be caused by a lot of different things. We've seen actual extinction that's happened in our lives. We have lots of organisms um, and species groups that have been hunted to extinction. Um, so the environment can make a big change. We've had <clears throat> certain organisms, it's pretty clear from, from the visual evidence that we see that um, the dinosaurs, there was something pretty colossal that, that led to the destruction of the, of the dinosaurs. So anytime that you have an organism that cannot survive, okay, now of course evolutionists say it's because they don't have enough adaptation or they can't adapt enough to allow them to survive. And so remember survival of the fittest as natural selection says, it will choose the best or the most fit. So they would say, hey, extinction is actually a natural, or is a cause that comes by way of evolution, okay? Where I would say extinction, yeah, it is caused by the environment, absolutely true, that's true evidence, but to assume that extinction is, is really correlated to 
the lack of evolutionary adaptation in an organism is, is false. That would be that would be akin to me saying that the reason why I, you know um, why someone dies in a car accident is because you know they haven't learned how to swerve correctly. Okay, so they haven't developed the adaptation. So when the car's coming the other way, they can't get out of the way, and that's that's not entirely true. We can't boil it down to that. The problem ultimately with all of evolution, guys, that we're going to keep running into is where does this leave us? If this is completely true, guys, what, who mat? I mean, what's that matter that a species group it goes extinct? That's natural selection, survival of the fittest. In fact, survival of the fittest for us may be destroying every organism except for those that we deem necessary. Why don't we destroy all of the animals that don't provide food for us, or all the animals that don't, you know, um, you know, provide a service that we feel like we need? And so. There's definitely a, a real clear danger in going down this path. So that's just a little bit on WSQ number 24, and we'll talk uh, a little bit more about those ideas in class.